tutorial are first how to uh, how to find help here at the MSI. Then when we go over the experimental design, uh, we want you to feel comfortable and I'm going to repeat myself a little bit. Sorry about that because I didn't start the recording early enough. So we want you to feel comfortable in your decision of single cell versus bulk RNA-seq or methodologies. Um, we're going to talk about how to design your experiment so that you can answer with confidence whatever question you are looking for. And then uh, we're going to go over analysis tools and steps for your data. And finally, we're going to um, talk about some methods for analysis of very particular uh, questions. Okay, let's get started. The first goal is uh, how to find help. So it depends on your question. If you want to know how to use the system, if you are new, one of those that respond that you are new to the MSI and you are having troubles logging in, you are not sure if you belong to a group in the MSI, some questions of that sort, then you can email us at help at msi.umn.edu. We have people um, looking at this um, email address and they will be happy to respond to your needs. If, on the other hand, or what you are looking for is some help with something related to your more biological research, for example, how do you design your experiment, or maybe if you can contract an analyst for them to help them with their analysis, do uh, email us at rephelp at msi.umn.edu. Same if you have some feedback about uh, this tutorial. Okay, so we'll get started with the first, uh, the first big part of the tutorial, which is experimental design. And the initial part, the initial question is, for those of you that are thinking about understanding more about the single cell genomics, or uh, if this is the right thing to do, then um, the answer is that single cell methods are really good because whole tissues are in general heterogeneous. So if your question is intended to the diversity within a tissue that is not easily accessible, then you are in the good workshop, in the right workshop. For example, let's imagine that you are working with a small intestine samples. And if you wanted to test the effect of a treatment and you did bulk RNA-seq of a chunk of tissue, you would get the mixed signal of many, many different cell types. You can get results and that might be just good for your uh, question. But if you are interested in how a specific treatment modifies some specific cell type, let's say the epithelial, or maybe you are more interested in the immune subpopulation, then you need to do single cell. So we say that tissues are heterogeneous because they are diverse. And this diversity can look like different cell types, as we just discussed, or it can look like different developmental stages, or it can look like different activation states. So the difference can be subtle or can be more defined, but the point is that you want to see those differences. The types of questions that you would like to answer in general could be just an exploration of your tissue. For example, um, what kinds of cells are present in this tissue and what is the proportion? And other could be like, if I am seeing some differentiation in this tissue, what is the trajectory of this differentiation? Those type of, of questions are more in the exploratory realm and you don't really have treatments. You are using this to uh, generate hypotheses. Another option is that you actually have treatments and what you want to do is test the effect of these treatments in the different cell types. For example, do the proportion of cell types differ between treatments or maybe the trajectories of differentiation differ between healthy and disease? So you can ask these types of questions. And to get the answer, since we are looking into single cell uh, information, we need a way to Mm, either label or physically isolate these cells. We need to be able to know 
that the information comes from a specific cell. And historically, the, there have been different technologies trying to do this. But in general, what you are trying to do is, uh, for example, if we take this from one of the main technologies nowadays, which is called, um, which is from the company 10X Genomics, what, what would happen is that you have a heterogeneous tissue with many different types of cells. You dissociate them, and then each cell is separated, hopefully. And then in your cell suspension, you pass it through a microfluidics uh, chip. And the goal of this chip is to make little, little droplets that are like reaction chambers. The goal is that in each reaction chamber, you will have one cell and whatever is needed for getting information out of it. In the case of 10x, you have beads. And these beads have tags, unique tags. So you can have these tags attached to the molecules inside of that cell. And then when you go through library preparation and sequencing, you can relate uh, which information comes exactly from each cell by using those tags. Okay. The thing is that if we are going for the single cell route, then it's because we are interested in this higher resolution. And this is amazing for some questions, but we need to consider that this is not for free. <laughs> what I mean is that even though you have higher resolution because you're looking at single cells, you also start with very little amount of material. You have one cell in one mini tiny bubble. What, what is your reaction chamber? So the information has, for lack of a better word, has holes. And I explain myself a little better. When you do bulk RNA-seq, you get a big tissue and you get a bunch of reads. And then when you map those reads to the genome and count how many hits each gene has, then you have many hits per gene. But if you start from one cell, then you get so much less material that you don't have as many genes. You cannot capture as many genes. And then that's why you get all of your genes in that cell uh, but many of the expression counts would be zeros. So this, so um, we call this type of result uh, sparse matrix. And it has a particular, um, it has some particularities that we will go through in the analysis that, ha that have to be dealt with. Another thing to consider when you're doing um, single cell methods is that the goal is to capture lots and lots and lots of cells. But at the end, you will be paying only for X amount of reads, of sequencing reads. So there is a balance between the amount of cells that you capture and the depth of sequencing. Normally, this balance is in favor of more cells and lower depth. And what happens with this is that some cells are expressing some genes, but the expression level is low. So if the expression level is low, the chance of you getting a molecule of that gene while doing the prep and then amplifying it, if the sequencing depth is low, it decreases. In other words, sometimes your favorite genes that you are sure your cell should be expressing are not found in this data. And that is something, that's a reality that we need to know before embarking here. Any questions so far? If you have questions and you're through Zoom, feel free to unmute yourself and ask or just type them in the chat and then we'll go through. Okay, if we are convinced that we want to do single cell methods, um, then our next step is to plan experiment in a way that we are certain that the answers are, we are getting are due to our treatments, are due to our questions and not for some weird factor that we didn't take into consideration. From the people here, or Zoom as well, just a quick raise of hands of if you are familiar with something called batch effect. Yeah, cool. <laughs> Marissa and I deal with batch effects all the time, so. <laughs> okay. Um, and what about, have you ever encountered a painful experience of knowing that you cannot use your data because it's confounded. 
Does that sound familiar? Okay, so we'll go through it with this story. Imagine you are working with mice and you are, have a control group, which here would be the, the gray mice, and you have a treatment, which would be depicted as the brown mice. You extract your RNA and then you send it for sequencing. And uh, then you get your results and a summary of your result is this plot of uh, principal components. And you see that your treatment mice cluster together and they're very tight and far from your gray mice. So you are happy because, oh, look, my treatment has an effect. But then it turns out that you inquire more and realize that all your controls were sequenced in one of the sequencer lanes, while all the treatments were sequenced on one on another sequencer lane. So being a conscious um, researcher as you are, you start to wonder, like, is this difference due to the treatment or is this due because there was something different in the process? And the truth is that you don't know. There's no way of knowing. In this case, in this example, the treatments are confounded with some sample processing a step. And if that's the case, unfortunately, you cannot learn anything about your treatment effects. And it's very sad, but this happens with a high frequency. So this is why we mention it right now. Um, <laughs> if you are familiar with the term um, batch effect, you probably are also familiar with uh, algorithms that are meant to correct for a batch effect. So I'm going to define real quick what's a batch effect. Batch effect is a source of variation that you unintentionally add to your data. It could be added at any point of the process. For example, the sequencer links that we talked about in the example before. And yes, there are algorithms that you can use to try to control for this variation, which is unwanted. Um, but it's very different if you have a batch effect, which is an unwanted source of variation, then it's very different to have a confounded batch effect. Because while you can control for a batch effect, for example, in this, which I'll go through, if it is confounded, like in the sad tale that I told you before, you cannot do anything about it. How to control to, for batch effects? If, in the example, instead of using one full lane for all the controls and one full lane for all the treatments, we either did a blocked uh, sequencing, meaning uh, we put some of the treatments and control in one of the lanes and some of the others sequence and control in the other lane, then we could control for the batch effect. Does that make sense? We can go a little bit more into it later. Now, uh, so sources of unwanted variation. How do you even know if you, if you are adding this to your experiment? Um, so these are some sample questions to help you think about it. Uh, for example, did you use the same reagents for all the samples? Did all animals come from the same leader? Um, were the samples collected? Was the RNA or DNA extracted on the same day by the same person, by the same facility, same location? Uh, were all library preparations performed on the same day? Was it the same library preparation? Like there are many nuances that you have to think about. And the point is that any of this, if any of these answers is no, then you have patches and you should think on how to control their effect. One way is how we discussed before, just blocking. And uh, this is another example of blocking. For example, if you have three treatments or three groups that you are interested in, group one, two, and three, and you do uh, duplicates of each of the treatment, but you can only process samples in, you have to split all your samples in three processing batches because you cannot, you, you are only one human and cannot do so much work at the time. So the best way to deal with the batch effect here and be able to control it later would be to, uh, instead of using group one and uh, prepping it in the batch one, 
and group two in the two and three in the three, which would totally confound the, your effects. What you would do is select one of the replicates in one treatment with the other replicate in another treatment and prep it in one batch. Then the other replicate of the other treatment plus the other replicate of the other treatment and prep it in the other batch and so on. If you assign each replicate that rather than each group per batch, then you can control for the batch effect. Also, it's very important that you keep track of these batches and what's going on with your sample because uh, that helps the analyst uh, go back and try to control for whatever unwanted source of variation. Um, any questions here? Okay, so we go to the next part, big part of experimental design, which is biological replication. So, um, I'm sure you are familiar with the statistical testing, but it's good to remember that single cell experiments are the same as any other experiment in the sense that to have any idea of the statistical uncertainty, we need to have biological replication because only with this we can measure how spread out is the signal across those replicates. So if you have a chicken, you extract 10,000 cells of a chicken and you do single cell experiment with this, this is still an N of one. You have only one chicken. It doesn't matter if you have 10,000 or 100,000 cells, it's only one chicken. So it would be better maybe to have five chickens and then from each of them take 2,000 cells, then sequence all of them. For reproducible results, uh, we need all of our samples to be uh, representative samples of the population that you want to describe. An example of a good approach would be if you were using mice. Um, as a representative sample of the mice model you work with, you would choose six mice, apply your treatment to half, and the rest uh, let them be controls. And then from each mice, you capture 10,000 cells. In this case, your n would be six, and that would be okay. If you are doing multiple samples, um, it is important that you can separate the cells that come from each sample. And this process is called multiplexing. Does this ring a bell, the term multiplexing? Sure. Okay. So basically the idea is that um, you want to label each sample or replicate with uh, identifiable tags. And then when you have all the samples labeled, you can mix them and then sequence at the same time. That way you can reduce the sequence effects and costs, batch effects and costs, and also you can support replication. If you are working with uh, humans or mouse or some organisms, uh, then you can uh, work with 10x genomics or maybe BioLegend for these um, labelings options. Um, but if you're working with other organisms that maybe have cell walls or maybe are not human or mouse, if you are working with other organisms, then don't despair, there are still options for you to label. And you can investigate with either a consult to the UMGC team or looking into other companies like PARS Bioscience or PIPSIC. Um, so, um, multiplexing is highly recommended and I wanted to go through this figure here to just um, kind of explain a little bit why is it so good. So this figure, I took it from uh, this paper, which is, uh, uh, which was reporting a technology called SciSeq. The researchers wanted just to show that uh, you could use antibodies to label some of the cells and that way would, you would get more information about it. In particular, what did, they did was um, they analyzed mixtures of mouse and human cells. They mixed the cells and they incubated them with oligotag antibodies, which were specific for either human or mouse. In figure A, you can see a scheme of that. So you have your antibiotic specific for the species and then some oligotags to them, attached to that antibody. After incubation, then they send the cells for sequencing. And then they looked at the results. So in panel B, 
you see that um, cells that have the reads mapped to human to the human genome, most of the reads mapped to the human genome are colored with the with green, and are placed mostly here. So having a lot of transcripts in the human transcripts axis, like axis, but not many in the mouse transcript axis. On the other hand, the mouse cells uh, show the, the opposite pattern. Most of the reads were from the mouse genome. But then also, you could see that there were some cells, or thought to be cells, that had transcripts mapping to both genomes. That, of course, is not a biological true result. So what's going on? They compared that with what was, uh, what with what they got from the. I'm sorry, my screen just blanked. What what with what they got from the um, from the antibody counts, and they saw that um, they would get very similar results. Human antibody tags would be located here, and mouse antibody tags would be located here. But these these cells would have a mixed uh, signal. So if you label your cells, you can not only label your uh, replicates and samples, but you can also use it to clean up the things that are not actually single cells. These might be just reaction droplets that got more than one cell, one human, one mouse, or something like that. Okay. Um, if you are going to do multiplexing and if you're going to try different technologies, it's good to use the low depth trial run that the UMGC offers as a test drive. So you can uh, see if you can recover all your cells and if you <clears throat> see all the expected tags and samples in the expected proportions. And finally, in this part of the, um, of the talk, we wanted to touch on the biological quirkiness of your system, which you can and should consider before going for single cell experiments, um, just to design it better. So for example, how many types of different types of cells do you expect to find in your tissue? And what are their relative abundances? Um, because if you are interested in a very rare cell type, maybe uh, you need more tissue, or maybe you need to enrich for that rare cell type. Or maybe um, are your samples very small? Do you even have enough material to do single cell? Are your samples precious? Are they from very rare uh, disease that you cannot get easily? Or are your samples logistically challenging to work with? Like, do they have a weird shape and they just wouldn't fit inside a droplet? Like, are we talking about a meter long axon? Then it, a droplet based method wouldn't work for you. Um, then is it a multinucleated cell? Is it a uh, are you expecting to have a pure culture or are you expecting to have a lot of contamination? All these things you have to think uh, beforehand and talk with the UMGC people or the people that are helping you with this so that you can design it well. Another thing to consider is how many replicates are you planning to include and how much money you have and how are you planning to spend your money? Because there is the balance between the number of replicates the number of cells per replicate and the sequencing depth. And this is also something that you need to think about. To help you think about this and decide, there are options and there are packages to uh, calculate the sample size that you need or to see if you have enough power to check the differences that you want to check. In general, there are many things to think about, but don't worry because we have um, made a form that is available for you if you want to use it and if you're planning a single cell experiment. This form here will walk you through all these questions and try to help you out uh, designing and deciphering what are the next steps. If you have issues, if you don't know how to answer it, also just send us an email and we can help with it. Um, with that, I think maybe five minute break. And then we'll go to the second part. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Yes. Um, 
I know multiplex is good, but recently we were um, talking with tenants and realized that multiplex is kind of pricey. Yes. But um, so we were trying to use the gym as flex. Mm -hmm. um, but would that be um, still good approach to use? Yeah. Um, what I know, and can they can help. The whole question? Yes. The question was that um, multiplexing is pricey and uh, they, um, they want to know if uh, we would recommend using it, um, in particular the flex kit from 10 Genomics. Yeah, GemFlex. The GemFlex kit. Yeah, I think, I think it's uh, released like, very recently. Okay. So, uh, we right. probably haven't seen the data yet. Yeah. Yeah. It's really Marisa recent. and Zara, yes, can help. Um, if it's a very recent kit, uh, I don't, I don't know that we've seen data about it from it. Uh, we have used the Flex kit, which I don't know if it would be the same that you're referring to. And the data that I analyzed with that kit was really nice. But what was the trick? The trick was that it was human data and uh, the cell viability was super high. So uh, I think the recommendation, the last recommendation that I heard from 10X was that if your cells were of certain organisms and the viability was really high, then the results were okay. If they were not, then they weren't recommending using the, those particular tags. Um, Definitely, that, that's something that you need to talk directly with the company and ask for their recommendations and their current recommendations. What I know is that human is easy to work with, mouse is easy to work with, but if you're working with turkey, <laughs> then no. Multiple scenes, like um, it was multiple samples were captured in a single. Yeah. 
captured. Um, okay, shall we? Right. Um, I have a question before we get started. So a few slides back, you had um, the list of possible batch effects. Um, in case we have like one batch effect that we think might be confounding our results, how do we lose a lot of power by correcting these effects? Yeah, so the problem with some of the batch correction algorithms is that they try to fit the data so that the batch effect is not observed. What happens is that sometimes true biological signal gets flattened and you will not see it. So yes, that can happen. Is it a common occurrence? Um, yeah, <laughs> I guess, <laughs> I would say. What you can do is, you don't need to control for batch affecting that way, like using a, a, like some matching algorithm. If you can just add the batch as a covariate. And in that case, uh, that the variability that is given by that covariate is added into the model of the gene expression, for example. And it doesn't really get flattened. The signal of the genes. That would be like a softer, more gentle approach. Okay? Mm -hmm. Good. Thanks for asking. Do feel free to ask. Okay, the next step, the next part, is uh, an overview of the analysis tools and the steps uh, for your single cell data. So since most of you in the poll uh, said that you felt somehow comfortable coding, I will just run through some options that are coding free. Uh, there are external resources for people that don't feel so comfortable with the coding options uh, and they prefer to use a graphical interface, just clicking around. Um, there are different options and I would recommend looking at this blog um, opinion blog on available graphical tools. Throughout the presentation and very heavily in this part, you will see that there are some um, links. These links go to different documentation or tutorials or things like that. So when we give you the slides, do feel free to look around and click. Anyway, so there are many options for uh, graphical interface analysis. These options, unfortunately, cannot be supported by MSI because we are not the builders, the developers, so we don't know much about them except that they exist and that they are an option. Um, some have limitations on the input data types and organisms that you can use, um, but some are pretty good. For example, uh, I wanted to talk on Asimuth. Asimuth is uh, a web interface where you can upload your data and do some basic QC and use the single cell references that they have hosted in their website uh, to annotate yourselves. You can get outputs from this uh, that are like graphical descriptions of your data, like UMAPs or violin plots. Um, you can also get lists of genes that are descriptive of your cell population. The trick here is that this works really nicely if you're working with human, because most of your of the references that they host are human. Uh, this is a screenshot of the references that I found recently, and you can see that they are um, like neurons or pancreas or kidney, bone marrow, all from human. So, but it's a bit. Okay, now for the people that uh, are not thinking about using these tools, but more about the resources that are available at the MSI. So for everybody, what we offer is data storage and high performance computing. That's the basics. If you're going to do a single cell experiment, for example, single cell RNA-seq, uh, you can assume that you'll need at least 30 gigabytes per 10K cells, only for the row sequences. Now, if you are going to do the analysis and you have only one sample, this is per sample. And if you have more than one sample, then you will need a lot more space. So having 
big storage space and high performance computing, then it's very useful for your analysis. Another perk, perk is that if you're working with UMTC, your data gets delivered directly to your MSI space. But if you are not, then you can also uh, transfer your data from other sequencing centers or other repositories. Now, if you have the coding expertise or you have the bandwidth to learn uh, from the, all the resources that are available anywhere, um, then you can just use uh, the software that we already have installed and maintained in the MSI. Uh, we can also, you can also use the, a graphical interface that we offer that's called Open On Demand. This is also a link for you to look. And, we can, and you can also go to other research computing tutorials that would teach you how to uh, use the command line or how to install software. This is if you have the time and the want to learn how to do it yourself or you already know. Now, if you don't, then we also offer um, and the, a contract-based service with an analyst here at the MSI. This analyst will work with you from the design of the experiment until they give you publication-ready results. And uh, if you want to go this route, please email us again at ribhelp.msi.umn.edu. For the people that are wanting to do things themselves. Um, this page contains uh, lots of links with useful information from how to use the uh, graphical interface to tutorials on how to analyze your data with R-based programs or Python-based programs to also how to connect to our systems or look for, ask for resources and use the, the software that is already installed. All these links can walk you through that. We don't have time to go through it in this tutorial, but the only thing that I wanted to put in here was that if you're going to install packages, make sure that you uh, are trying to do it in a folder where you have uh, writing permissions. If you were working in the R environment, the way you would do that is start your R environment and then modify your, the path where you want to put your libraries and then prepend a play uh, a folder where you have writing permissions and then you can install the packages there. If for any reason the links in the thing below don't work then you can also see the, the full the full links here. All right so those were the tools that are available but let's get into the data itself. What do you get when you go and start your sequencing thing. Um, I am going to focus on an example, an imaginary scenario in which you worked with UMTC and used 10x genomics technology. I'm focusing on this because this is the, the, the vast majority of projects that we get are going this route. If you do this, then as I told you, the UMTC will deposit the sequencing data directly in your MSI space in the folder and in a folder that's called data delivery. All data here is organized by date uh, and quarters. And what you will find is uh, a set of FASTQ files per sample. Here in this example, I have four FASTQ files per sample, but depending on your technology, you'll get more. Um, on top of that, the UMGC also uh, gives you a folder that's called analysis and that contains the automated results from uh, using cell ranger which is a analysis pipeline that was developed by 10x genomics so let's see what's inside that analysis folder if you go inside you will see that there are different files you will have uh, shell files clip files um, comma separated files a lot of files, but I want to focus on here, this one, the filtered feature barcode matrix directory, which contains the counts per gene and droplet that have passed the QC filters from the automated pipeline from Cell Ranger. When you go to a start your analysis, either with Surat or Scampi, this is the path that you need to give to tell them that's the info, that's the, that's the info that I want to keep analyzing. 
And I also wanted to go through the web summary HTML file. This you can download and then open with whatever is your preferred internet browser. A disclaimer here is that when UMGC runs this, it does it for free, I think. Like, it's just, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it's run um, in a per sample basis and with default parameters. So if your experiment is a little bit more custom, um, then you might need to rerun it and you might need to tweak the parameters. For example, if you are using transgene, transgenes in the organism that you're studying, these transgenes are usually not included in the reference genomes. So you will have to make a custom genome and then rerun cell range. And another option is that you don't have transgenes or anything weird, but you have several samples. If you have several samples, then be aware that the cell ranger outputs cannot be used to compare things across samples. So you will get, for example, a cluster one of cells in sample A. That cluster one might not have not anything to do with cluster one of cells in sample B. It's just a different story. So you cannot compare. Okay. The Cell Ranger report is an HTML file, and this is a screenshot of a real report that I got from real data. Um, I like to use these reports to assess the data quality, how it worked. And I have highlighted the things that I look at initially. So the first is the estimated number of cells. You would like this to be as close to the expected capture, like the cells that you're trying to capture as possible. The other metric is the median genes per cell. This is highly dependent on the organism that you're working with. For organisms that are very well annotated, like human, mouse, rat, all this, uh, you would want to see thousands of genes per cell. But there are organisms that haven't been studied so much, so they have poorer annotations. And you would be OK and lucky if you got at least 500 genes per cell. Um, so this is to pay attention, but <clears throat> it depends on your organism. OK, then uh, the sequencing metrics. You want to see a high percentage of valid barcodes and valid UMIs. And you want to see that most of your reads map to your gene, which is this percentage here. If that doesn't happen, <clears throat> it means that maybe you have high levels of contamination, and that could be worse. Finally, um, this plot, it's nice because it's a quick way of assessing the signal to noise ratio in your data. <clears throat> this plot is called a cliff and toe plot, don't ask me why, uh, but basically what is depicting is in the x-axis, the number of barcodes, cell barcodes or basically droplets, and in the y-axis, the number of UMI counts. UMI stands for Unique Molecular Identifier. So basically, this is the number of unique molecules per barcode. This is what the plot is showing. You will see that there are some barcodes with a lot of UMIs, but then this usually decreases. In an ideal scenario, this decreases, and then at some point, it has a, a sharp cliff. When this occurs, then you can draw a vertical line <clears throat> and this number would be the estimated number of cells that you have in your sample, that you actually capture in your droplets. Um, if, what, what's the reason behind this? Is that if you have cells captured, then you get a certain amount of, of molecules. And then depending on the type of cell, whatever, you have some. But then if you <clears throat> stop counting the cells that have molecules, and then you stop looking at the droplets that they don't have any cells, then you will have a lot less counts because they, they have no cells. So then you have this change in the shape of the plot, and this is called the toe, and this is basically empty droplets and background noise. Good. <coughs> Sorry. OK. So this is all that I had about the QC, uh, automatic QC. And from now on, it's the more hands-on analysis. Um, 
maybe some things are going to sound familiar and maybe some others don't. Stop me if something sounds weird. The more hands-on analysis starts once you have the cell by gene count matrix, which is the cell ranger output, for example. You load it into your either R or Python package environment, and then you use the packages to analyze it. And it's just five simple, five simple steps, you could say. <clears throat> Step one would be continue cleaning your data, do some QC. Step two could be, would be transforming your data from such a humongous matrix of mostly zeros, which is a high dimensional and sparse matrix, to something that is more workable. The third step is using that transform data to cluster the cells. Then you would identify each cluster. And then sometimes you would like to do differential gene expression. So we will go through these steps. Step one is QC. And if you remember what we talked about before, um, the idea, the goal is that in each droplet, you will have one cell. This is a good, a good quality droplet, but <clears throat> there are options to have bad quality droplets, like droplets that have no cells, empty, droplets that have more than one cell, or droplets that have like cell debris or dead cells. So we need to remove them. Okay, so the dead cells. The dead cells are droplets that have either cellular debris and or dead cells and have mostly mitochondrial sequences. So depending on your tissue, you can um, set a threshold of this is what I think is healthy in this plot. This is a violent plot and each dot is representing one cell. And you see the distribution and you see, hey, these are the healthy cells and maybe these weird ones are just outliers of cell debris. So you can just set up a threshold and say, boom, bye, filter out all this data. But maybe then you want to get rid of the empty droplets. And for the empty droplets, I like to see either the UMI distribution or the gene count distribution. This is a histogram of the number of genes, which here is a feature, um, the number of features or genes in each barcode. And this comes from the filtered barcode matrix, the output of the cell ranger. This is, this, this is the automatically clean data. You can see that most of the barcodes, most of the droplets have around, I don't know, 600, re 600 genes. But some of them actually have very few. To my eye, this looks like these are cells, these are actual cells, but these are indeed just empty droplets that have some background noise. So in my case, I would set up the threshold here and clean out all of this. <clears throat> um, this threshold, I like to to set it depending on the distribution of the data itself. But some people have just set thresholds depending on the literature or depending on what other people are doing. And we'll talk about these thresholds later. Another option uh, to display the data is in a scatter plot. And here I'm showing the number of UMIs or counts on the X axis and on the Y axis, the number of genes. You would expect that if you have more genes, then you would have more accounts in general. So this has some sort of a linear shape that goes up. Now, if you have multiple cells in a droplet, then usually you get a very high number of either genes or uh, counts or both. So some people just say, you know what? Anything above, in this case, 3,500, will be considered a multiplet, so I'm going to filter out this. That's another option. If you have tagged your cells, then you don't even have to do this because different tags will show up in the cells that are in the droplets that are multiplets, so you can get rid of those easily. Um, or if, for example, um, you don't want to just set up a threshold, uh, you could also use packages 
that are able to model mixtures of cells, multiplets, and then compare each of your transcriptomes to that model and give a score, which is what I did with this plot. I used the package single cell do double doublet finder and uh, I colored each of the cells with the score of the probability of it being a, a multiplet, a, do a doublet. And you see that some of them are these high that have high numbers and some of them are here, which are actually also in the upper region of this line. So it's consistent, is what I'm saying. Um, anyway, so those are the, the bad quality droplets. In this plot, I'm showing everything that you need to consider. You need to consider the percent of mitochondrial reads, which is coded in the color, the, the number of UMIs per barcode, and also the number of uh, genes per barcode. If you plot all that, then you see that you get really ugly dead cells here, and you see that you have some that maybe multiplets because they have too many there, or maybe you also have some, um, some cells that are actually empty droplets. Uh, the point is that you need to tune these thresholds based on your experiment and your expectations, and you have to do it on a per sample basis, because every sample has their own journey and you cannot just use a blanket thing. Um, these thresholds can be based on what other people are doing with similar material, and you can find in the literature 10x genomics also has some recommendations. It can be also based on the distribution of your own data, or you can use some different packages for estimating it. And these are links to those packages. So after all this QC, you can ask yourself, is my data good or bad? And um, well, that's a tough question. But what you want to do is just ask yourself, can I answer my question with this data? If yes, then awesome. But OK, a good rule of thumb to see if your data is good is uh, to know, to check that it has few bad droplets, either dead, empty, or multiplets, that if you are multiplexing, you find all your oligos and in the proportions that you expect. Uh, that your cell count is as close as your expected captured cells, and that most of your reads map to the genome. This is all I have for QC. Do anyone has a question about QC? Just uh, this, um, the mitochondrial content yes. changes if you're doing single nuclei. If you're doing single nuclei, what you are doing is um, basically bursting open the cell and just selecting the nuclei and get the RNA that is inside the nuclei. In theory. Sorry? In theory. In yeah. theory, yeah. exactly. So in theory, you shouldn't get a lot of mitochondrial content. But it can happen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is, that, is there any other metric that you could? Because I was thinking about ribosomal or content, it could help to remove cells that contain too many ribosomal genes expressed. If you're looking for specifically dead cells, like cells that are actively dying and are undergoing apoptosis, maybe they might express apoptotic pathway genes mm -hmm. that you can like calculate a score for as being a way to determine it. But I feel like oftentimes people don't really filter nuclei data on mitochondrial percent because you really get low counts um, and can't really tell if it's dead or not in that case. But that's just like my experience. But if you really wanted to go <laughs> the whole nine yards, you could try to do like apoptosis, look at apoptosis genes that aren't mitochondrial. Also, it might here. be like a, a warning flag if you're getting lots of mitochondrial reads in uh, single nuclear data because you shouldn't. So that would mean that maybe you have contaminated, like it's not so clean, you have background noise. That is also another metric that somebody asked today, um, is like with single nuclei data, 
a lot of ambient RNA can appear in the sample. And so in the Cell Ranger report, there's a metric called percentage of reads in cells that you could look at. Um, so you'd want that to be a high percentage. If it's low, then that means that a lot of your reads are ambient, um, noisy signal. I feel like it's hard to determine what is what because it could be a biological condition to a certain like a disease state or something. So it's so complicated. Oh yeah, you're absolutely right about that because people who are studying cancer have a lot of yeah. apoptotic mm -hmm. cells. Mm -hmm. So it's like if you don't want to throw all the cells out based on mitochondrial percent because those are the cells you want to actually measure mm -hmm. <laughs> like or something. So that's another case of like how to decide your thresholds for your experiment. And if you're expecting to have cells with high levels of mitochondrial RNA, then maybe your threshold should be a little higher. All right. Second step in your analysis would be the data transformation. This is a whole can of worms. So, and I honestly wouldn't give justice to all the algorithms if I started to go into the details of that. So I'm just going to give an a, a overall idea. Um, as we mentioned before, uh, single cell data is highly dimensional. You have many, many cells, tens of thousands. So that's one of the dimensions of the matrix. And the other dimension is all the genes. So you have a matrix that is tens of thousands by tens of thousands highly dimensional. And on top of that, you also have that inside this matrix, there are so many zeros that is just a waste of time and resources to try to analyze the data as is. So what happens is that um, the counts, the actual counts need to be modeled and transformed so that the analysis can be done in a lower dimensional, more informative way. In single cell, uh, the most commonly used technique for dimensionality reduction is called PCA. It's not the only one, but it's the most common. PCA stands for Principal Component Analysis. And what it does is that it groups the genes in groups, or also called, like, also known as principal components, in a way that each principal component is able to, this, a combination of these principal components can describe your cells the best way possible that ha has been op optimized by the algorithm. So you have just groups of, of genes that are principal components. After you've done this data transformation, you use this low dimensional data to do the clustering. So the clustering is based on the PCA. And then you can plot the clustering results using another reduction that's called the UMAP or the TSNE. UMAP or TSNE plots are very good for plotting, for making these sort of figures. But they have, they are some uh, algorithms that are called, they are known as nonlinear dimensionality reduction algorithms. What does this mean? This means that if I look at this plot, which is a UMAP plot, I can see that I have many cells that cluster together and are quite similar among them. So, good. The same with this other cluster. But the problem with the UMAP algorithm is that even though it's very good at depicting similarities, it's not good at, depicted, at depicting differences. So, it's incorrect to say that this cluster must be very different to this cluster. That is a very wrong way to read the UMAP because it may or may not be true. You can also not say with any certainty that this cluster is more similar to this one than this cluster is to this one. So basically, please don't be tempted to read too much into the uh, UMAP plots of cell clustering because it is a very simplistic two-dimensional representation of a highly dimensional data set. Another way to represent the clustering is using a clustering tree. I particularly prefer this because you can see how the clustering changes depending on the level of similarity or granularity that you are using to cluster your cells. This level of similarity 
is what is known as the resolution parameter when you're using the clustering algorithms. So you can think about it as a similarity threshold. So if you have a cell and you have your resolution, your similarity threshold, you can say, are you similar enough to this other cluster, to these other cells to be put in the same cluster? Or are you just different enough to be your own different cluster? That is kind of my take on resolutions. So if you have low resolutions, you have, you are being very permissive, saying everything is the same. I don't care about fine differences. But why, when you go to higher and higher resolutions, uh, you are able to capture more subtle differences among the transcriptomes of different cell types. <clears throat> so you can see that, for example, in this figure, at low resolutions, we had all the cells in one cluster. But after increasing from resolution, that is here, 0 to 0 0.1, all your cells were different enough to make five different groups out of them. If you keep increasing the resolution, then you see that some of these groups keep dividing and you can find different little subgroups within. Then uh, when you do this process, then you eventually will have to choose a resolution, which is the, the resolution that best describes the data in a way that you can do the comparisons that you want to do. For example, if you are interested in knowing how is this cell type or cell cluster different than this, then I would go for resolution 0.1 and then compare this versus this. But if what, if what interests you is actually this subdivision, then you would need to choose the resolution 0 0.3. Does that make sense? So is this just similar to setting a threshold? It's a threshold. Okay. It's just that with different, it's actually with different thresholds, you get different clusterings. And so one thing you can see here is that the clusters on, on the right side are very stable, right? So those cells are kind of, they're, they're in the same cluster, no matter what resolution you're, you're using. Um, but then on the left side of the diagram, you can see that there's a little bit more instability in terms of where the cells end up. Like those arrows are showing, oh, these, clusters, these cells moved over to this other cluster. Um, and so, there's a um, SC3 stability metric that you can also apply with this cluster profiler, or sorry, cluster tree visualization um, R package, and you can kind of see which where your clusters are the most stable, and that can help you choose your resolution. With the resolution, you're just trying to choose like what what groupings of cells am I going to compare downstream? Yeah, that's a really nice way to put it. You you're just choosing how is my best way to group my cells. Um, so yeah, plus three, it's a nice R package that make, helps you make these visualizations, which to me are very useful because you can see how stable the clusters are and also where, like the lineage of the cluster, where do these actually cells actually come from? Oh, you are actually subtypes of this one. So that is informative for me. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you are not into trees, you can also look at UMAPs and uh, you can plot UMAPs at different resolutions. In this example, for, ex for example, in this data set, you can, you can color the cells based on the cluster ID that we give it at different resolutions. And you can see that when you increase the resolutions, then you, uh, there, are, there are more clusters. At resolution 0.3, there are 10 clusters, but then a resolution 0.7, there are 15 clusters. Now, if your question had to do with what is different between this subgroup and this subgroup of cells, then the resolution that you should choose is 0.8, because that's the one that helps you differentiate those. Okay. Next step. Once you have defined your clustering and how is the best way to group the cells, uh, then you would like to identify 
what these clusters are. And uh, there are many ways to do that. And this usually means that none of them is perfect. So you actually have to choose a consensus of what is best from all these different sources of information. One thing that we would that we usually use and we like how it works is the package single R. Single R uses bulk RNA-seq data or microarray data as reference to label each cell independently. So what it does is that it compares the transcriptome of each cell with the reference and gives you the best matching cell type from the reference. It's very nice when you do it and then you see that all the cell types from the same cluster are uh, colored and identified as the same type, like monocytes in this case is this cluster. Or here you would find the uh, NK cells or, you know, something like that. What's the problem? Uh, is that this algorithm will always try to give you the best matching cell type. And if there is not a best matching cell type, which actually is the true type, then it would give you whatever is best the, from what it can find. So what I'm trying to say is that if you are missing cell types in your reference that are present in your data, this could lead to mislabeling. And I will give an example. For example, this data set, it was labeled um, with the singular package and the blueprint plus encode reference. And it gave an identity to each cell type. The identities are fine in general. You find B cells, immune cells, epithelial cells, blah, blah, blah. This sample actually comes from a, an ovarian tumor. So you would expect to have cells that are only in the tumor. But here, some cells here were actually identified, identified as mesangial cells, which are cells from the kidney. That doesn't make sense. So that's an example of a mislabeling due to the fact that in the reference, there were not any cells that were similar to these ones, which ended up being ovarian tumor epithelial cells. But those are not in the reference, so it just gives you the best it can. This is particularly difficult when your cells come from undifferentiated samples um, because they are not similar to anything. They are just starting to differentiate to be something. So you usually need to use other sources of information. And these are other sources of information that we usually uh, use. Uh, for example, if you have known genes that you know need to be expressed in the specific cell type, then you can project the relative expression of that gene onto a UMAP or you can make a violin plot or whatever you know you want to see if uh, which cluster has the highest expression of that marker gene, as is this case. Or you could also look at the um, principal components and see if there are some groups of pr some principal component that it's actually a list of genes that are particularly overexpressed in a cell type. Or uh, you can <coughs> look at the differentially expressed genes or features of your different clusters. <clears throat> and this is a, a test that I'm going to talk about later. But <clears throat> long story short, what I'm trying to say is that identifying cell types is not trivial. And usually, you need to gather information from many sources and collaborate with the people that are experts in that cell type. So if you are the analyst and you are trying to share what you have done so far with a, an expert, you can use a package called LoopR if you're using the R uh, environment and Surat. And with this package, you can make a dot loop file, which is um, which you can load in the loop browser. The loop browser is one of those graphical interfaces I mentioned at the beginning. Um, and that lets you make plots and see the relative expression of some genes or make uh, violin plots. And that could help you um, facilitate the collaboration with some experts. For using the looper package, you can just um, 
use these commands and that's it. Uh, another option would be the Vision package, which is similar, but a different option, different flavor. And finally, uh, I will go quickly through the differential expression analysis, which would be the last, the final fifth step in our analysis overview. I have to warn you that this is a very uh, hot topic right now and the best practices are not yet solidified. We are seeing new algorithms developed and new best practices being recommended every time. So keep tuned and to see if there are new developments. But so far, what we are going to see here is what the current status is. <clears throat> um, for cell identification, as we mentioned before, we could use the differentially expressed genes. So that means that we can ask, how is this cluster different from all the other clusters? And that is usually achieved uh, or could be achieved using the function, function find all markers if you're using the Surat package. This gives you all the gene markers that are particular, like that are expressed in this cluster compared to all the rest. And it could help you determine what's the identity of this cluster. But we are aware because if you remember, we already used the gene expression data to make the principal components, which are the groups of genes that are very descriptive of your data. And then you use these principal components to make the clusters. And then you are using the same data to ask these same clusters, hey, how are you different from all the rest? Well, spoiler alert, you're going to get things that look like the principal components, maybe. Or you are going to get answers with an inflated level of certainty. This is seen as extremely low p-values, and it's a known problem of single cell differential expression done as this. This is called double dipping and has been uh, discussed a lot in the literature, so you can just Google away and see what's been said. The point is that this is not uh, recommended for differential gene expression across treatments, but it could be helpful for identification of the clusters. If you wanted to do to know what's the effect of some treatment in a cell subpopulation, then you do need replication. And the way forward, the current uh, recommendations are that you go through your workflow, you identify your cells, and once you have identified the subpopulations and know what they are, then you can uh, step back and say, hey, I have already used the higher resolution of single cell data. I know what my cell sub subtypes are. Now I'm just going to aggregate the counts from all these cells in one more robust signal. This is called cell debulking. So it's like stepping back because it's using the high resolution and then going back and saying, you know what, let's add all this together. Um, so aggregate all the counts from the same cell type per sample and treat that as a replicate. And then when you treat that as a replicate, then you can use packages that are time proven and that are uh, have been used for differential gene expression like HR or DSEQ2 for bulk data. That's the current um, recommendation. Um, there are other options like using um, mixed linear models and if you are into that you can look at this paper uh, that goes that gives some advice on it. Um, also I would like to say, just to close the loop with whatever was said at the beginning, that ideally you have no batches. But if there are batches, then you can go through a process that's called integration. Integration is not trivial, and depending on your data set could work better or worse. It has been shown to dampen, to dampen true biological signal. But if your signals are robust enough, then it can work pretty good. For example, in this example, you have data from different patients. 
um, each color is a, is a patient. And it's the same type of sample. It's the same type of cell. I think these were PMPCs. Um, so before integration, you see that the cells, the clusters are kind of together, but you see that they differentiate a little bit depending on the patient. So pre-integration, you see that this might be one cell type, this might be another cell type, this might be another, but there might be some difference due to patient. If you would like to control for that difference, then you would go through the integration process and then your clusters would be merged. Again, if your cell types, if the signal is different enough between cell types, then comparisons and identification should be fine. But if, for example, these were differentiating cell types, then that would be a mess because the, the differences are subtle and then you would dampen them with the integration procedure. Um, at the end of your story, then you would like to publish your data and make everything reproducible and happy. So if that's the case, um, make sure that you look into taking care of your data. The MSI will store your data for up to one for one year after it's released. So you have a full year to upload it to public repositories or download it to your personal drive or whatever you want to do. You have a full year to do that, but don't forget to do it because then you might lose your data. You don't want to do. That. And then um, also you would like to share your code and make everything reproducible. And if that's the case, uh, we recommend using either Git and GitHub or our Markdown are good packages for that. And with that, this is the end of the second part. And let us know if you have any questions. Should I just uh, begin? Give yeah. you time. Yeah, I can probably just keep, <laughs> keep right, going. Sorry. <laughs> no, no break Hustle. right now. But <laughs> <laughs> sorry to take away everyone's break. Um, welcome everyone again. Thank you for attending our single cell genomics tutorial. My name is Marissa Macanto, and I'll be covering the third part of our genomics tutorial, uh, which is covering single cell analyses that you could do downstream of everything that Natalia has talked about. And I'll also touch on, um, so these are the last five things are things you could do downstream of what Natalia has talked about, um, but I'll also touch on other types of assays or library prep methods that are possible with 10x genomics specifically. All right, so the first um, library prep method or assay that uh, I'll talk to you about is uh, single nucleus attack seek. So for those of you who have never heard of attack seek, it is a, an assay that can measure regions of the DNA that are open. So, and so we call those open regions, open chromatin regions. And these regions appear at gene promoters that are actively undergoing transcription and at enhancers that might be regulating active genes. Or it could also appear at genes that are poised for transcription, but aren't actually transcribing anything yet. So the way, you know, I have an illustration here to show what that kind of looks like. Here's some chromatin. You can see right here that it's condensed and closed. And then there's other regions that are open. So the nucleosomes are spaced out and some naked DNA can be seen in there. And so the way that this assay works is that you can utilize this TN5 transposase enzyme that for this assay comes preloaded with sequencing adapters. So when you add the enzyme to your DNA, it will find these open regions and cut at that site. And while it cuts, it inserts the adapter. So you'll have some nucleosomes and then the transposase on either side tagging that DNA fragment. And so you can then take these fragments amplify them and sequence them. And when you map them back to your genome of interest, you'll see these what the, these peaky signals. So these are read pileups that are coming from where the transposase integrated into your DNA. But you'll also notice that there's kind of signal kind of throughout the genome because transposase is not 
doesn't care where it's going to insert. Anytime it sees an open site, it's going to nick it and add tags to it. So this is kind of like background noise. So an important part of the attack seek analysis is trying to determine what's a real open chromatin region. So it's going to, there are algorithms that are going to look at these peaks, look at the background noise around it, determine what's a real open chromatin region or not. So if you decide to do single nucleus attack with 10x, you would take your nuclei, run it through the chromium controller, sequence it, and you'll get back 10x single cell attack fast cues. So it's a set of fast cues similar to what Natalia showed you before. And the UMGC will probably process the data for you, but if you need to reprocess it, you can load the UMGC module and then load the Cell Ranger ATAC software. So Cell Ranger ATAC is a 10x genomic software package. There's going to be a lot of different Cell Ranger packages I'll talk to you about today, but you basically will load the Cell Ranger ATAC program. You'll use the count command, and all you provide is the, the path to the directory of sequencing files from the ATTAC assay. You would specify the sample prefix on your sample so that it knows, like the software knows, this sample is what I have to analyze. And then you would also provide the ID or the output folder name for Cell Ranger. So it'll create this folder for you with all of your data in it. It also requires a reference that's specially prepared for Cell Ranger attack. So that's available through the UMGC module too. They also have Cell Ranger ARC versions of the reference that can be used. Um, but essentially, when you launch this command, Cell Ranger attack will do attack count will essentially do everything for you. It's going to map the reads to the genome. It's going to call peaks or determine what's open, open chromatin region, and it's going to call cells similar to what Natalia showed you with the gene expression analysis. It's going to determine what's a real cell and what's not real cell based on how much signal it's seeing from the open chromatin regions. And then it will generate a counts matrix, but this count matrix is going to be your peaks by your cells. And Cell Ranger Tech can also do other downstream stuff, but I wouldn't recommend using it unless it's for preliminary analyses. Uh, I, but I would take the count matrix that's generated here and import it into R or Python or whatever your preferred programming language is for downstream analysis with your preferred packages. I listed Surat and Signac here because I'm familiar with those. Okay, sorry. So here's an example of a single nucleus attack seek data set. Um, and you see a nice UMAP plot where cells are, cell types are labeled on this UMAP. And if you look at the Surat Signac vignettes for attack seek analysis, you're going to notice a lot of similarities to the gene expression analysis. It's the same steps that Natalia outlined, where you're going to filter out cells, but in this case, you're going to be filtering on different quality metrics. Instead of numbers of genes, it's going to be numbers of peaks. And then you'll have like TSS enrichment score or nucleosome score, or, you know, they have all these other types of scores or fraction of reads and peak score. There are all these different ways of assessing quality of a cell, and you're going to have to determine what what's going to pass your filters and what's not going to pass your filters. Then there are also different normalization methods and there are some new functions, but a lot of the other steps that Natalia described like PCA and UMAP, like a lot of these functions are reused. But I just wanted to note that assigning cell type identities within a single nucleus attack data set is a lot more challenging because you have peak coordinates, you have genomic coordinates, not genes. So how do you figure out what a cell is based on coordinates alone? So Surat and Signac offers an R package called G, or sorry, Signac has an, a function called gene activity, which essentially is just taking all of the attack reads that map within a gene boundary and saying, hey, that's the gene's expression. Um, and using that as a proxy for gene expression. So then you can take that gene expression, quote unquote, and use that to help annotate your cells. 
or alternatively to make it a little bit more interesting if there's an existing data set out there that's already been labeled and you know it's the same as your data set you can try to do a fancy procedure called label transfer by like integrating your data sets together to transfer cell type labels over but just note that you know that could be messy all right, so that UMAP that I showed you for single nucleus attack was actually taken from a paper that did a multiome experiment. So multiome libraries are another type of library you can prepare. And they're pretty cool because they're allowing you to assess both gene expression and open chromatin from the same set of cells. So you're getting a lot more information. In this paper, you can see that the UMAPs look different. And the reason for that is because they actually analyze the data separately. Even though it's the same set of cells, they just clustered the data on peak signal on the left-hand side and clustered the data on gene expression on the right-hand side. But um, you can actually take this a step further by doing weighted nearest network analysis and try to leverage both types of features, both your peak features and your gene expression features for clustering to maybe even get more highly resolved clusters out of this than what you currently have. And so there is a vignette linked down below if you'd like to learn more about it or try to attempt it. So uh, to if you have a multi-ohm library and you have to produce accounts matrix from it because the MGC hasn't done that for you yet. You can take your single cell attack fast cues and your single cell gene expression fast cues from your multi uh, experiment that are deposited in your run folder and you can run cell range or count on it. So it's very similar to the other commands except now there's a libraries argument and so you have to provide a file saying Here's the path to my fast cues that are attack fast cues. Here's the path to my gene expression fast cues that are, you know, gene expression fast cues. So you're telling it exactly what is what. And then the program can basically do everything for you. And when it comes to downstream analysis, you can import each of these into R separately, or you can import one in first, analyze that, import the next one right in after, or do the analysis jointly. There's kind of a lot of possibilities uh, with this. Okay, so the next uh, library type are BDJ libraries. So these will apply to the immunologists out there who really care about identifying particular clonotypes of T cells and B cells. So this library type is really cool because you're essentially sequencing the receptor, like a portion of the T cell and B cell receptor that will uniquely identify that T cell or B cell. So kind of a little backstory so that I don't have just an illustration here that means nothing. Uh, T cells and B cells undergo, like during their development or their maturation process undergo somatic recombination of the DNA of their T cell and B cell receptor genes. And so basically the DNA gets mixed and matched in different ways to produce unique combinations of the variable region of, or unique combinations of this receptor. And so what the assay is actually doing is it has primers that are going to flank the side of the variable region. And so we're sequencing that variable region of these receptors of each cell, if that makes sense. So when, it, when we need to process the data, we can use Cell Ranger VDJ. And this is what Cell Ranger VDJ is doing. So it's taking all of the reads that came from this library, and it's assembling them into the T cell receptor beta chains and the T cell receptor alpha chains. And then it annotates them by what it thinks it is because it, you know, these chains have different domains potentially. And then it will call cells. So it'll say, oh, these T cell receptor alpha and beta chains have this cell barcode, so it's cell one. And these chains have cell barcode two, so it's cell two. And if you look at these cells and you look at the chains, you can see, okay, well, cell one and cell three have identical alpha and beta chains. So I'm gonna group these as clonotype one. These are the same cell clonotype. And this one has a unique beta chain because it has these two notches in the V, so it's a different clonotype. 
So the Cell Ranger VDJ will essentially do this analysis and it will generate some really useful tables for you. This is one of them, though I think this one was actually generated with SC repertoire. So that's a package in R that's down, that can, you can use downstream of Cell Ranger VDJ. But essentially this table is showing you all the clonotypes that were found. So it's just given a number, the number of cells that have that clonotype, the proportion of cells that have the clonotype. And then it's telling you this clonotype has this T cell receptor beta amino acid sequence and this T cell receptor alpha beta sequence. And so I think Cell Ranger VDJ actually doesn't give you amino acid sequence, it gives you nucleotide sequence, but you can use a C repertoire to convert it to amino acid sequence if you are really interested in the actual sequence itself. But the other useful table you'll get is a table of all of your cell barcodes and all of your clonotypes. So that can actually be imported back into R or Surat, Surat and then you can color code your UMAP plot based on clonotype information to kind of see where your T cell clonotypes are appearing on your UMAP plot. So like these tables can definitely be brought back into R and integrated with what you've already analyzed. Okay, so that kind of covers it for like the different types of assays and library types that 10X offers. I mean, there, I didn't talk about it. There are also ADT libraries you can generate because I saw some people said that they were interested in protein expression. So you could also generate ADT libraries against particular um, cell, uh, sorry, proteins that are on the cell surface of your cells that will indicate whether it's a B cell or T cell or what have you. So that's a possibility too. And, you know, some of these library preps can be done in combination with each other. So you could do ADT with gene expression and VDJ. You know, like all three of them can be done at the same time. And then there's another Cell Ranger program that you can use to demultiplex all of that. If you have questions about that, feel free to contact us at rib-help at msi.umn.edu. Okay, so now we're going to get into the types of analyses you could do downstream of single cell RNA-seq, though some of these you can do downstream of single cell or single nucleus attack-seq too. So just keep that in mind. So um, the first analysis we'll talk about is trajectory inference analysis. So trajectory inference is um, a computational technique that can allow you to extract temporal information from a single cell sample. And, you know, if you think about it, a single cell sample is a snapshot in time. But what we're actually leveraging here is the fact that we have thousands of cells. We have so many cells and we're expecting some of these cells to be at different states of development. Like not everything, you know, is perfect, right? So here's an illustration of that. Like if I have a, a population of cells here at time zero and I decide I want to treat it with something and I collect my single cell sample at 12 hours, you're going to see that some of these cells are not going to respond to the treatment. Others might be in an intermediate state of response and then some will be fully activated to that treatment. And so if I capture this sample, like with single cell and uh, basically use principal component analysis to reduce the dimensionality, you'd see something like this. So I just rotated on its axis here. And I have, I don't know how to move this. Um, and basically, uh, one of those types of software available called pseudotime software. So there are kind of two flavors of trajectory inference. There's pseudotime analysis, and then there's RNA velocity. And they both extract temporal information from single cell samples, but the way that they approach it is very different. Um, and I'll talk about RNA velocity later, but I just listed some software here in case uh, you want to look it up later. But for right now, I'm going to talk about the pseudotime software. So the way that these software work is they'll take your single cell sample, they'll reduce the dimensionality of the data using PCA or independent component analysis or some flavor of dimensionality rejection. And then they'll construct a graph. And they're going to figure out what cells are nearest to the other cells. 
and then you draw the shortest path through the graph, and that's your pseudo time. That's basically, I mean, the way I interpret it. Correct me if I'm wrong. But in the end, you kind of collapse it all onto a single axis, and then you can, um, like in this illustration here, you can draw the pseudo time axis through your cells. So in this paper from Vanderberg, uh, they actually had three pseudo time axes. And they're all originating from this green cluster up here, and you have three distinct lineages. So this sample, the single cell sample, is actually capturing cell differentiation happening in the brain. And so you get that, those cool structures. So I just wanted to point out some pseudo time software here because uh, these are some of the most commonly seen ones by me. Slingshot is really easy to use. So any researcher can just dive right into it, apply it to their data. PAGA is Python based, but I listed it here because it handles more complicated trajectory structures than Slingshot can. So it can handle cyclical trajectories and disconnected ones. And I'll get into that in a little bit. But another thing I wanted to touch on is that usually pseudotime software, I think, is commonly applied to a single sample. So you have a single RNA-seq sample, you can draw your trajectory through it. But if you have multiple samples, like treatment and control, or something like that, you might want to look into software that are capable of handling multi-sample trajectories, like Lamian, in that situation. Okay, so like I mentioned before, this example had three trajectories. If you look at this illustration down here, this is from a review paper on pseudotime software. You can see the, here are different pseudotime methods, and then they actually have the different types of trajectories that they could handle. And also their scores on different metrics, but I'm only showing like the top of the table. This table was huge. So these are like the high, like, high scoring ones. But you can see PAGA is at the top here because it can handle all of these different trajectory types. Slingshot is down here, so it can't handle disconnected and cyclical versions. And I have actually seen this successfully used on immune cell data, where somebody had a cyclical trajectory where immune cells were switching between exhausted states, activated states, and like non-exhausted states, uh, or something like that. Um, but I just wanted to also mention that if you do use these software methods that oftentimes you won't know where the origin of the trajectory is. So it is up to you as the researcher to figure that out using your detective skills. You're gonna have to look at, yeah, the either ends of the trajectory and be like, what's more stem-like and what's more terminally differentiated or, you know, so on. So. I listed some appropriate use cases for the software because I think this is important to highlight that, you know, you can't just use this to, on any sample. It's going to give you weird results if you decide, hey, I'm going to use this on PBMCs and I know they're all terminally differentiated cells and it's just going to draw, try to draw a trajectory through these random cells, um, cell clusters. So in that case, it wouldn't be appropriate. And in some cases, you might want to subset your cluster of interest. Like, I only want to look at my T cell cluster, so you take it out of the map and then do trajectory analysis on it. Okay, so now I'm going to just briefly touch on RNA velocity. This is the other type of uh, trajectory inference method, but, you know, it's not doing all this PCA and stuff under the hood. Instead, it's actually looking at unspliced mRNAs and spliced mRNAs to be able to figure out where a cell is headed. So it's actually count, you know, counting how many reads are mapping into introns versus exons. And it's using that to infer, is this gene actually being upregulated or downregulated? Because if it's getting, if it's actively being upregulated, you're going to see more premature transcripts that haven't been spliced. And if it's getting downregulated, you're going to see more spliced mRNAs. And then you might see a mix of the two if it's in steady state. So the figure down here is from one of the RNA velocity papers that was looking at a nerve, uh, a uh, nervous system or like a nervous system tissue sample. And in this paper, they highlight that the radial glial neurons are kind of like the stem-like population. 
which are in orange here, and you can see they're just points there, which indicate it's like in steady state. But then you can also see vectors radiating out of that stem cell population into the astrocyte population or into the neuroblast population. And it seems like the neuroblasts don't have a steady state. They just then differentiate into granule neurons or the CA123 neurons. And so, yeah, it's interesting that you can take a single cell and summarize where it might be headed based on looking at a bunch of genes and whether those genes are getting, are, you know, unspliced versus spliced. Okay, the next type of analysis you could do would apply to people who are studying tumor samples, but it is possible to infer large scale copy number variation using single cell RNA seq data. And I know that sounds really weird to use gene expression to figure out where deletions and duplications have occurred in the genome. But what we're essentially doing is we have positional information for where these genes are along the genome. So we know gene A, B, C are ordered on chromosome one. And if we see that like all of those genes are just like their expression is like disappearing in the tumor cells versus our normal cell type, then that could be indicative of potentially a large scale deletion event or a duplication event. Because, you know, the genes are pretty much random, like for the most part, they're kind of randomly all around the genome. So you wouldn't expect all of the genes in a region to just not be expressed or be twice as highly expressed. So in this figure, which is from the infer CNV paper, uh, the plot on top here are all the normal cells or what they're calling our reference cells. And all of the cell types down here are some flavor of tumor cell. And so all of the tumor cells you can see have half of chromosome one being deleted, and then other portions are deleted or duplicated depending on the cancer cell type. So in first CMV generated this plot, there are other tools out there that can also infer copy number variation. But the appropriate use case for the software is for single cell data that you know has tumor cells in it, but also that you know has control cells in it. You know, you want to be able to have some good reference uh, in it as well. Okay, so the next uh, type of analysis one could perform, like Natalia touched on this too, is uh, looking at differential cell type proportions. So, you know, if you collect single cell samples from the same treatment, you might see, and these are from patients, you could see a lot of patient to patient variability. Like some patients just have really different proportions of immune cells. And so, and then also, you know, collection procedures and tissue dissociation, though those steps can be quite messy and you could get really different cell type proportions from that. So never just trust one sample to be your, you know, reference. So you want to have more than one single cell sample, which is something we've been harping on this whole like presentation. And Propeller is one such tool that can help you find significant differences in cell type proportions uh, between groups in a single cell experiment. But you need to have biological replicates and it will use those biological replicates to measure the variability in cell type proportions. And it uses empirical bays under the hood to stabilize variance estimates. And it also comes with a lot of different testing methods. So you could, it has t-tests for simple pairwise comparisons. If you have a treatment control comparison, you can just use a t-test. But if you have treatment control and you have patient information for this treatment, like same patient for treatment control, you can include that as a covariate linear regression model to then, you know, do testing on your cell type proportions there, controlling for patient effects. Um, and there's also ANOVAs for multi-group abundance comparisons that are offered. But this tool is from the Speckle R package, and it's pretty nice. So here's like an example of it being applied to uh, one data set that has very clearly a lot of 
differences um, in cell types between control and treatment. So these are the same tissue, like this could be, I think, spleen, but you can see that the control has the cell type cluster nine for all four of these replicates and the treatment group completely has none of those cells. So when you quantify cell type nine, 21% of them are present in the control group, 0% in the treatment. And so that is a significant uh, result by t-test t here. Okay, five more minutes. I think I can make it. <laughs> All right, so Natalia talked about pseudobulking. And so I'm gonna touch on it a little bit more because it is really important. Um, currently the single cell DEG testing methods that are available in Surat. I mean, there are some kind of sophisticated ones, but you know, they might downsample your data and stuff too. So you're not even using all of your data in the analysis. Um, but generally they're not sophisticated enough to, you know, include covariates in the models or, you know, and then you have this issue that you have so many cells like in each sample and your p-values are going to be inflated or look more significant than they really should be because you're treating each cell as a biological replicate when they're actually technical replicates. So pseudobulking is like the preferred method for DEG testing because you're collapsing all the expression or you know you're aggregating the counts from every cell type and sample so you're going to have pseudobulk library for sample one, cell type X, sample two, cell type X, sample three, cell type X for your treatment group, and the same for your control group. And then you can just take that pseudobulk data and perform differential gene expression testing using one of the like really good methods out there like EDGE-R, DEC2, or, or LIMA. And in that, you can also control for other covariates that you might want to control for, like patient effect or batch effect. And so there are two um, pseudobulking functions that I've used. One is through the EDGAR package, and it's called surat to pseudobulk. So it will take your surat object, and then you just say, I want you to aggregate counts by cell type and sample, and then it will do that for you. And then the other function is average expression from Surat, from the Surat package, and that will do the same thing. And so both of these can be applied to your multi-sample single cell data uh, to get you started with the pseudobulking process. Okay, last analysis I'll briefly touch on um, is the Cell cell communication tool software. So if you're, you know, if you're a researcher who has a bunch of cells that you've annotated and you're like, oh, well, which, which cells are talking to which cells, you can use cell cell communication software to help you figure that out. So what's underlying the cell cell communication tools a lot of the time are these huge databases of receptor ligand pair interactions. So what we could do is say, oh, does cell type X have this ligand and does cell type Y have this receptor? And then you can just try to gauge the strength of the interaction. It's a little bit more complicated than this because, as we know, receptors are actually multimeric, you know, proteins. So they have a lot of different proteins. So some of these software packages like cell chat and cell phone will first check to say, does cell type X have all four of these subunits that are part of this receptor to be like, it has that receptor. And then it will make calls on, you know, what the actual recept uh, expression of the receptor is based on like the most lowly expressed subunit. They'll say, oh, if you only have two counts of this subunit, then your expression for that receptor should be two counts. And then it will try to, determine the strength of the interaction. So how it does that, there are like, actually there are a lot of different ways that it can do that. Some methods will just multiply the expression of the ligand by the expression of the receptor and saying, that's your score for your interaction. So if you have a very high value, you're interacting a lot. If you have a very low value, you're not interacting a lot. Other methods average expression, 
in each cluster, and then they'll average expression of the interaction pair. Um, and then there are, there's another method, which I'm not forgetting. Oh, yeah, DEG testing. So sometimes they'll just do DEG testing on each cluster, figure out what genes are differentially expressed in cluster X and cluster Y, and then they'll do the same thing, where it's just like if they're both differentially expressed, then it's likely they're interacting. Um, there are other things that it tries to, uh, with the methods that are just using average expression of ligand receptor values, they do do like so, um, assign significance values to the interaction. They will randomize like the cell type labels in your clusters and then ask, okay, do these cell types still interact strongly via this interaction? And so we'll generate a distribution and then ask, well, was the interaction value I saw for the clusters before randomization as strong as this null distribution? And, uh, and then you can have p-values for your interactions too, which is kind of nice. Um, so yeah, these are like some of the software I've listed for that. This one's a little bit different from the others, but I, it's, very, it's a lot more new and I still have to read more about it. But the other thing is that, just note, some of these software are very human-centric. So the, the databases of receptor ligand pair interactions are like for human only. And if you want to get it for mouse, you have to do a conversion step between mouse and gene, human IDs. And then I think cell phone might have both mouse and human receptor ligand databases. But that about covers it. And sorry, I'm two minutes over. Um, so if you have any questions about any of the content, feel free to ask it now, or you can message us directly at help at msi.umn.edu or ribhelp at msi.umn.edu. And I think we also have a poll for. Yeah, I think maybe what, since some people, it looks like they might have dropped off. And, oh, yeah. Yeah, and people in the room are on Zoom. I will send out the poll to everyone by Google Form. Okay. For the end. Sounds Just great. Just to get feedback in terms of what you guys found was useful in the tutorial and what you'd like to learn more about. All right. Cool. And yeah, if you are planning a single cell experiment, you can check out this form that we have to help with that. Um, if you have any questions, we'll be happy to take them.